All right, I'm going to ask you, if you have your Bibles with you, to open them, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians 5, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 11, down through verse 21. So you can follow along as I read. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit." speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Verse 18 here says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. There are some expressions such as baptized in the Holy Ghost or the filling of the Spirit. Those two phrases, neither one of which occur anywhere in the New Testament. It doesn't matter how often you hear them. Neither one of those phrases, exactly those ways, are found in your Bible. I want to consider the subject today, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Or I guess the title would be, how to be filled with the Spirit. At conversion, a believer receives the justified life. And this is because of Jesus Christ having died for him. Christ died long before any of you or I were born for the sins that we would one day commit. And uh, understanding that, we can reach back in time. It's a, it's a spiritual transaction. And take the merit, the virtue, and the, the righteousness of Christ dying as a sacrifice and apply it to our needs. Amen. And our guilt of our, of our own actions and our sins are transferred to him. And a tremendous transaction takes place between the sinner and the Savior. You go from sinner to saint that fast. It really does. You really do. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How do you get into Jesus Christ? Very simple. By asking Christ into you. Jesus said in John 14, verse 20, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. It's a very simple uh, matter. At least it should be. We sing, Tis done, the great transaction's done. I am the Lord's, and he is mine. He drew me, and I followed on, charmed to confess the voice divine. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Amen. And he doesn't wash your sins away in a water baptismal pool. He washes them away by the working of the Holy Spirit, and it's a matter of faith. The Lord Jesus told the woman at the well, John 4, verse 24, God is the Spirit, and they that worship him, <clears throat> excuse me, must worship him in spirit, and in truth, nothing you can do physically will affect some change in you spiritually. That can only be done by faith in God and trusting that his word is telling you the truth. And um, this is because of Christ's suffering on your place that you go from sinner to saint. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, Now he, that's God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
since you trusted Christ to be your Savior, God now sees you as righteous in a way he can accept. Paul writes, that I may be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. Philippians 3, verse 9. The Apostle Paul writes, For ye are bought with a price. That price was the blood of Christ shed on the cross. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They both belong to him. 1 Corinthians 6, and verse 20. A Christian should understand this and now want to serve Jesus Christ in some way. What does this verse mean? Be filled with the Spirit. It's an active command and it's intended that every Christian will seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. One of the best ways to learn something in the Bible is by making comparisons. Let me begin by showing you what filled with the Spirit does not mean, and by process of elimination, maybe we can figure out what it does mean. First of all, point number one, there are some Christians, and they're sincere Christians, I'm not going to deny that, and mostly from the old-time Pentecostal movement. That's a phrase that's not heard very often, the old-time Pentecostals. A lot of you don't know this, I'm going to reveal it to you. Those watching on YouTube after this, you'll learn it as well. About uh, 30 years ago, no, I mean longer than that, but 35, 36, 37 years ago, I used to play the electric guitar in a Pentecostal singing group. I was the only person there that wasn't a Pentecostal, but I played the guitar for them, and they liked that, so they asked if I joined them. And the leader of our group was a Pentecostal preacher, and we were having a concert at some... Uh, Pentecostal church one night, and he said, I feel so excited, I'm about to have a Pente old-time Pentecostal whoop de doo whatever that was. In my mind, I was thinking, go ahead, I'm going to stand over here. But those kinds of Christians seem to think that to be filled with the Spirit is when you actually receive the Holy Spirit. You can be saved, you can ask God to forgive your sins and make sure your name is recorded in heaven, but you don't, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit until you actually receive him at some future date. I heard a Pentecostal minister eulogize somebody at a funeral saying, Brother Smith was saved 1945, received the Holy Spirit 1947, so forth. In his mind, they were two separate events that needed to take place. Let me show you from the Bible why that idea is wrong. I want you to open your, turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. And I'll call one or two verses to your attention here. Romans 8, verse 9 reads, But ye are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. There's that you and him, him and you transaction again. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's not one or the other. Clearly, you're not a real Christian at all if you don't have the Holy Spirit yet. You can't say somebody belongs to Jesus Christ, but he's not filled with the Holy Spirit yet because he hasn't received him yet. They come together. Look at Romans 8 and verse 16. It says there, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How can the Holy Spirit confirm your salvation to you and confirm to you that you belong to God if you don't have him yet? The truth is, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. If you're not saved, you do not have the Holy Spirit. You might have your head filled with crazy ideas about life and the world and religion and God and any number of things, politics. But if you don't have Jesus Christ, you're not saved. It's as simple as that. So, to be filled with the Spirit does not mean to receive the Spirit. Secondly, 
there are also many people who think that, yes, you do receive the Holy Spirit when you ask God to save you and forgive your sins, but what you need is for him to energize you later on, give you a, a great zap of a spiritual electricity that will make you into a super Christian from that day on. You'll have power to call down miracles. You'll do all these number of things. And they think that uh, becoming filled with the Spirit is a separate and uh, distinct event from trusting Christ to save you. And that you won't have any victory over temptation. You won't have victory over the weakness of your flesh. And uh, you won't uh, be able to fight against yielding to sin. And any number of things that would make you ashamed of yourself. And your family ashamed of you. And you, everybody else ashamed of you by the way you're conducting and living your life. And you won't be able to talk to anyone about Jesus Christ. You won't be able to show them why they need to trust Jesus Christ also. Unless you're filled with the Spirit. And they believe once that electrifying thing happens to you, you'll be able to do all of these things with great power. Now, they're, they're partially right, only in that you can't do those things unless you're filled with the Spirit. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God if you're going to attempt those things and live in that way. Uh, without His enabling, without His inspiration, without His direction... You'll never enjoy being the kind of Christian that you want to be, the kind that God wants you to be. But to say that the Holy Spirit lives in you, but he is of little or no um, help to you until you've had this second experience occur uh, is false. It's sort of the present day view of the charismatic movement, which is sort of an outgrowth of the old Pentecostal churches anyway. Um, that these are two separate experiences or two separate events that need to take place in your life. Let me explain to you why this second idea is not scriptural. Not according to my own opinion, but according to what we can find in the Bible. The same Apostle Paul, who says in our text, be filled with the Spirit, he also wrote, and I'm not going to need you, I'm not going to have you turn, he also wrote in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, Verses 9 and 10. In Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him. Not incomplete. Which is the head of all principality and power. Paul says that in Jesus Christ those Christians had now found the fullness of the Father. The fullness of the Son and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And that they shouldn't worry about uh, adding, needing to add anything to it. Say, so how do you know that? Because he also says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. It's very enticing to some people, especially a new Christian. He's trusted Jesus Christ to become his Savior. He feels uh, some sense of, of relief that uh, his sins have now been forgiven by the mercy and the kindness of God. He's a Christian now in a way he never knew before. He might have thought he was, but now he truly is. He can say the date in the date and the time and the place where he trusted Christ when he first asked God to forgive him. It's very enticing for someone to come along and say, well, you know, if you really want to be a, a powerful Christian, you really ought to seek this experience over here. You know what that does? That diminishes the importance of the saving of the soul. And it gets his attention onto some mystical thing over here. Now this isn't, in the, this isn't spelled out this, these so many words in the Bible. This is Pastor Shrive, one, chapter 1, verse 1. That's the work of Satan. That's the work of the, of the devil to get your mind off of the wonderful work of Jesus Christ and saving your soul... And onto something, some extra experience you need if you want to do anything for God. You're sidetracked, exactly. You're distracted from the most important thing that will ever happen to you. Onto some secondary thing that's sort of flimsy and, well, did I get all of it? Do I need to get more of it? And so forth. 
And in their genuine zeal to please God, people want to be good Christians, they fall prey to this sort of thing. And Paul says those are enticing words. So to be filled with the Spirit does not mean simply to be energized with him. Thirdly, let me say this. There are many very nice people. Uh, and I believe they, they know Jesus Christ, and I think they love Jesus Christ, but they've been conditioned to think that to be filled with the Spirit is when you suddenly begin speaking in tongues. You never studied that language before, you don't know, you don't know anything about it, and yet you're able to speak in it miraculously. And uh, they used to call this the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the initial evidence of the filling of the Spirit is that you begin to speak in tongues. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it states, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I heard there on a day of Pentecost. Now listen, if the phrase to be filled with the Spirit means that the next thing you're going to do is start speaking in tongues, then it ought to be consistent throughout the Bible, shouldn't it? I mean, the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. You need to find at least two, maybe better yet three, texts in the Bible that would say that same thing and indicate that same thing, that to be filled with the Spirit means you start speaking in tongues. In Acts chapter 4, verse 8, the Apostle Peter is said to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And he doesn't speak in tongues. He begins to defend himself against the priests there at the temple after they raise the lame man outside the beautiful gate. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, the Bible says all of the believers were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God, not with tongues, but they spake the word of God with boldness. They weren't afraid to talk about God and the good things of God. In Acts chapter 9, verse 17, after Paul is converted, the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And the first thing he did wasn't speak in tongues, but he began to preach Jesus Christ publicly in the synagogue. Later in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, again, Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he rebukes a sorcerer named Elymas for his sins at that point. He didn't begin speaking in tongues. The Bible says that John the Baptist was, quote, filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, Luke 1, verse 15. And he never spoke in tongues. The same is true of his mother Elizabeth, Luke 1, verse 41. She didn't speak in tongues. The same was said to be true of his father Zacharias, Luke 1, verse 67. He never spoke in tongues. And yet the Bible says that all of them were filled with the Holy Ghost. In fact, the only place where the expression filled with the Holy Ghost is followed by people beginning to speak in tongues was there in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Unfortunately, some people have taken one verse and used it to interpret the rest of the Bible rather than finding one verse and interpreting it in light of the rest of the Bible. They've gotten it backwards. To be filled with the Spirit does not mean speaking in tongues. So what does the command to be filled with the Spirit mean? Well, here in verse 18 in our text, it reads, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The, Ap the Apostle Paul has drawn a contrast between two things. Somebody who is under the influence, like DUI, driving under the, and so forth, someone who's under the influence of, in this case, wine, and someone who is under the influence of the Holy Spirit, who's yielded to that. Uh, they don't call wine and beer and hard liquor spirits for no good reason. It's just a different kind of spirit. The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20, verse 1. If you are drunk with wine, you're not filled with the Spirit. And contrarywise, if you seek to be filled with the Spirit, 
you're probably not going to go out and get drunk with wine. Someone once uh, mentioned to Billy Graham years ago about a, a church that had disciplined one of their elders who they found drunk. I have to give Billy Graham credit for this. He said, I wonder what they would do if they had an elder who wasn't filled with the spirit. And they're both found in the same text. Notice the verse again, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. It evidently means to yield control of yourself to the Holy Spirit. Just like a drunk has yielded control of himself to some other spirit, to the power of the alcohol. And allow the Holy Spirit to do with you whatever he wants to do with you as a believer in Jesus Christ. God's a very practical God. I think as a Bible believer, you have to come to that uh, conclusion eventually. God's a practical God. And if he gives us a command to do something, he's certainly going to give us the instructions as to how to fulfill it, how to bring it about. Notice at the end of verse 18, the sentence doesn't end there. At the end of verse 18, there's a semicolon. That means the sentence continues. He says, be filled with the Spirit. And then he lists a number of ways this should become manifested. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now the psalms would be the book of psalms. Psalms in the Old Testament was the songbook, for lack of another term, of the whole Bible. All of them written by King David, intended to be set to music. Hymns would be some additional song written by someone not in the scripture for the purpose of praising God. And spiritual songs, when you come right down to it, would be some song that lifts the spirit. You don't get that from old groups like the Beastie Boys and Fine Young Cannibals and Death Metal and uh, Hip Hop and Rap. That's not music anyway. Uh, and a number of other things. If you want to talk about depressing yourself, listen to a steady stream of that for 24 hours. Even if you can only make a joyful noise, some people are tone deaf. You really don't want to hear them sing. At least you don't want to sit next to them when they're singing. Um, if you can't really carry a good melody, and you don't have an ear for harmony, and uh, that's really not your uh, talent, then he's got you covered here as well. He says, um, speaking to yourselves. But New Testament Christianity is different from every other faith in the world in that it's a singing religion. When you, the, the basis of popular music has always been love songs. When you're in love with somebody, you want to sing about them. And for the Christian who is in love with the Savior, he wants to sing about him. He wants to sing about the one who loved him enough first to suffer in his place on the cross, die for his sins, suffer on his behalf, die for his sake, and promise eternal life if he would simply yield and put his trust in him. When you think of all the songs that have been written in praise to Jesus Christ, Hinduism has no phenomenon like that. Buddhists don't have anything like that. And, um, and with, you know, I dare say, not even the Roman Catholic hymnals have any phenomenon like we have here. We have like 500 songs all singing the praises of one man in history. Go to the next church and you'll find another hymn book, a hymn book with another 500 songs for the same purpose. I would guess there have probably been no less than 50,000 hymns in hymn books available for Christians to sing throughout the country. At least 50, maybe to 100, maybe 100,000 over the centuries, over the years of time. You won't find a phenomenon like that anywhere else. You go to the Mormon church, they'll sing about Joseph Smith's revelation of the golden plates and so forth. That's not a song to Jesus Christ. I like that, I think I used this as an illustration when I preached this outline about four or five years ago. Uh, Randy Travis, you know, Nobody writes songs like country western songwriters. Is it still over? Are we still through? 
since my phone still ain't ringing, I assume it still ain't you. I know, the turn of a phrase, always very entertaining. But we sing, I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. See, that has an evangelistic appeal. You're singing to the person who needs to hear about Jesus Christ. When Fanny Crosby, the great hymn writer, I think was uh, 90 years old, this is around the turn of the last century, about 1910, long in there. They had a celebration for her 90th birthday, and uh, having written some 6,000 hymns, uh, she was receiving letters or telegrams from missionaries throughout the world uh, thanking her for her uh, work, happy birthday, and telling her what a powerful um, force her songs had and being so effective to win lost people to Jesus Christ. When they see the zeal, the happiness, the joy, and the thrill that Christians have singing about their Savior, it was very effective in drawing other people to want to know about Jesus Christ as well. That's what your singing ought to do. He's trying to have that in mind, that uh, this is my way of expressing my joy, my gratitude to Jesus Christ. And if along the way someone hears about that and hears it and is blessed by it, all the better. But um, God's people ought to be known for singing at the top of their voice, from the bottom of their heart, with real joy. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He says in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God. Are you a thankful Christian? Are you thankful for everything, good and bad? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's easy to thank God for good things. It's easy to thank God for blessings that come to you, things you weren't expecting, but man, what a thrill to have it. But what about bad things? He says in this verse, Giving thanks unto God for all things, the good and the bad. It's not easy to always thank him for bad things, things that hurt, things that are painful, things that are difficult to struggle through. And yet that's what we're supposed to do. The Bible says, um, well, I already covered 1 Thessalonians 5.18. But uh, verse 21, he writes, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. He gives us that chain of command. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, in verse 23. The church is to submit to Christ, verse 24. Children are to submit to both their parents, chapter 6, verse 1. Servants are to submit to their masters, chapter 6, verse 5. In chapter 4, verse 30, we're admonished to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. See, he's not a neutral, impersonal force, He's a person. He has personality, and he can be hurt and offended if the truth be known. You wonder, well, how can I grieve the Holy Spirit? Look at verse 29, chapter 4, verse 29. Corrupt communication coming out of your mouth. Dirty talk, things that are unbecoming of a saint of Jesus Christ to speak that way or talk that way. Are you seeking to be filled with the Spirit by turning over that part of your life to him. Some people cuss and swear so much, once they do get saved, they're stumbling and they don't know what to say. Everything, every other word was a four-letter word before. They don't know what to say. Those things take time. As they grow, God begins to clean up their mouth. He begins to clean up so many things about them. And you see the transformation start to take place. It's a marvelous thing to, to see, to witness. You know, the world expects Christians to be perfect. Modern Christianity has set the bar so low that uh, it's, it's very embarrassing many times. But if you have trusted Jesus Christ to be your Savior and one who can and did forgive your sins... 
that one who died for your sake, his blood was shed to pay for the wickedness that you would bring about by your sin. You have a home in heaven waiting for you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside your body. You believe God has given you a perfect book that you don't have to question. You simply have to believe it. And uh, you believe that when you pray, God hears your prayers and he wants to answer your prayers as according to his will. If you have all of those things, then the world has a right to expect something from you. The only way you can live up to their expectation of perfection and so forth is to be filled with the Spirit of God, is to seek His will, His direction, to yield control of everything you have to Him, to His control. He says in chapter 4 of Ephesians 4, verse 31, the Holy Spirit can be grieved by harboring bitterness and wrath, anger against one another. Verse 32, by not being kind to one another or tenderhearted, not forgiving one another. The person who seeks to be filled with the Spirit has a desire for these things. He wants these to be the characteristics of, of his Christian life and his testimony as a believer. Too many people think that if God would just zap me with the power of the Holy Ghost, I suddenly could call down miracles. I'll lay hands on the sick people and they'll get better. And I'll uh, name and claim that financial blessing because I sent my money into some TV preacher. And all of these crazy things. You know how it is? People, my dad used to talk, but I'm going to use this as a way of illustrating my point. My dad used to talk about people that would come to him when he was pastoring full-time with a whole bunch of personal problems. They'd, they'd been building up personal problems and developing all kinds of horrible situations for themselves. They'd spent 20 years you know, ruining their own lives. And they, was hope, they were hoping that the preacher could fix all that in 20 minutes. It can't be done. And um, you will not be filled with the Spirit unless you are constantly wanting to yield more and more of yourself to Him. It's not something that happens just like that. But you need to yield more of yourself to Him. So it requires a conscious effort to obey that command, be filled with the Spirit. You may have the Spirit of God, but does He have you? It's not how often you've read through the Bible, but how much of the Bible has gone through you, right? Someone said it's like having a guest in your home, and they have access to the bedroom, what you're letting them stay in, the bathroom, obviously, the dining room, the living room, but you don't want them going down to that bedroom down the hall where you piled all the junk, right? Because <laughs> you knew company was coming. In a way, that's how it is or with a Christian who says, I'm going to yield so much of my life to the control of the Holy Spirit of God, except this part over here. That I still want to engage in. That I still want to do. That I still want to participate in because I enjoy it and some fleshly satisfaction I get from it is more important to me than surrendering it to him. If he says, okay, and you can do it with a clear conscience, fine. But if something inside of you says, you know, Maybe you shouldn't go there. Maybe that's not where you would imagine seeing Jesus Christ go or seeing Jesus Christ do that thing. You know what? That is the Holy Spirit in you saying, don't take me there. That's the Holy Spirit of you in you telling you, let's not do that today. Because you have a twinge of conscience that activates when you're about to do something you know is less than keeping with the image of the perfect Son of God. D.L. Moody, one of the greatest preachers and evangelists in the history of Christianity. He once heard a man say, it remains to be seen what God will do with a man who has fully consecrated everything to the Holy Spirit. Moody replied, 
then I will be that man. I can consecrate all. And as I say, he went on to become one of the most wonderful evangelists, soul winners, preachers the United States ever produced or that ever came along in the history of Christianity. To be filled with the Spirit means to seek His direction, His inspiration, His leading, to be yielded to Him in every part of your life. Does He control what you watch on the Internet? Does He control what you listen to on your iPod or in your car? Does He control the things you do in your spare time? Does He control what you're reading? Does He control where you go? Does He control what you do with your so-called friends? saved or unsaved? Does he control every area of your life? No matter how much you think you've yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit, and in so doing you are filled with the Spirit, there's always more. There's always something more that you could give to the service of Jesus Christ and give up to be yielded to the Holy Spirit if you want to. He's not twisting your arm, making you. He gives a command. This is what God wants you to do, but he can't force you to do it. Does he have control of area, every area of your life? I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. I'm going to close right here. And I'm going to close uh, by citing a verse in the Old Testament. This is from 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 8. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever. If God has saved you, the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, he saved you forever, now he wants you to yield yourself to him. This is what it means to be filled with the Spirit, to continually seek to yield yourself to him, and put his direction in practical uh, application, singing with joy, being thankful, and so forth. This is to be filled with the Spirit. 